Wow, that was amazing. And I hope you realize that the matchmaking facilities that the Hebrew University offers are open to all. So this is, uh, take advantage of that. So thanks, Ariela, Tzvi, Mor, and Michal. And now to the next topic. So how did Hippocrates and Aristotle think about the human body? Dr. Orly Lewis has launched the ERC-funded project Atomly, a visual and textual atlas, and we'll hear from her how it's possible to bring medicine from ancient Greece and Rome into the digital age. Orly, a senior lecturer in humanities, teaches classics in digital humanities with a focus on innovation and entrepreneurship. We will then enjoy a quick Huji bite, a short film featuring PhD student Shani Vaknin, who is straddling life sciences and brain sciences to work towards a cure for brain disorders. And our final speaker tonight is using the training she received at our Global International Development Program to address the global crisis most salient in our minds in headlines for the past few months. Alumna Michal Bar, head of Israel's Emergency Programming and Operations Department, will share her thoughts about her experience on the Ukraine border. Please. Good evening, it's great to be here. So, when one opens one of the many ancient Greek and Roman medical sources, one encounters a confusing mass of technical terms and descriptions. One reads, for example, of vessels of different shapes and names, of parts lying behind or above one another, and detailed instructions on how to cut the body in order to observe these parts. These texts were clearly written by physicians and anatomists for a professional audience. And these verbal descriptions that we are reading rested on visual evidence gained from empirical observations of the body. But being an historian and a philologist, I was trained, like most modern readers of uh, these sources, in studying texts and words, not the body. I realized that in order to understand these texts properly, I must bridge substantial conceptual, visual, disciplinary gaps. And to do so, I set up a unique interdisciplinary team. A team with whom I can apply and am applying new methods, and with whom I can make, take my research beyond the long-standing textual and disciplinary boundaries. My team includes not only researchers of ancient texts, philologists and historians of uh, science like myself, but also experts in modern anatomy, 3D modelers and illustrators, product experts, data scientists, software developers. And our daily in-depth collaboration allows us to apply a unique skill set which goes beyond the traditional methods of studying texts and to combine philology and history with computational, empirical, and digital methods. So let me take you through our new way of studying history of science. We begin by translating our texts. Now, a translation, we translate them into English, a translation is already one stage in deciphering the anatomical ideas. It is also, importantly, what facilitates the collaborative collaborative work of all team members. We are translating these texts through careful, close reading, as scholars have been doing for centuries. But we are also applying computational tools, including dedicated code written by our data scientists. And these computational tools help us deepen our understanding of the text and of this genre of ancient scientific writings. For example, by mapping lexical relations between different terms or by mapping conceptual relations between different segments of the text. Once we have a translation, we turn to the anatomical deciphering, the collaborative anatomical deciphering. Together with our anatomists, they have the knowledge of anatomy gained from their long experience of looking inside the body just as the ancient scientists were looking inside the body. 
We also perform dissections according to the instructions in our ancient texts. And we do this in order to see the body as the ancient sciences saw it. The ancient text guides us, but at the same time, the dissections, these, dis these collaborative discussions and analysis improved our translation and understanding of the text. With improved understanding of the text, we set out together with our 3D illustrators to model the ideas, to create a visual, digital, three-dimensional representation of the anatomy described in the, anatomical, in the ancient anatomical texts. Now, let me give you a brief example of why the collaboration and why the rendering in 3D, in visual 3D, uh, models is so, are so important. So what you see here is a quote from a medical work written two and a half thousand years ago. And the author tells us that the brain of humans is double and that a thin membrane separates it in the middle. This anatomical point that he stresses is crucial for our author's attempt to prove that malfunction in the brain is the cause of epilepsy. But for me, or for anyone with my traditional disciplinary skill set, this is a fairly vague detail. I can imagine membranes of many shapes or many sizes running through the middle of the brain. The discussion and deciphering together with the anatomist and together with our illustrators led us to conclude to conclude that what we should model is this, that what the author is seeing and describing is, part, is a part which one can observe, really can observe in the brain, a sort of crescent-shaped, membrane-like uh, structure. Now, this is one example of one part in one of dozens of treatises that we have. And a point to stress here is that in antiquity, unlike today, anatomy was still a dynamic field, a field in the making. There was no single standard anatomy, but diverse anatomies in the plural. Each author had his own set of ideas of the structure of the body and its parts, and his own terminology to express it. So we have many anatomies to decipher, and many models to create. But it is not enough to simply create models. It was clear to me that these models need to be made accessible to researchers, and they need to be made accessible to them in a transparent manner, suitable to their scholarly needs, suitable, for instance, to the questions they are asking or to their need to know the textual basis of our interpretive decisions leading to this model. And it is to this end that we have developed Atlamy, an interactive atlas of ancient anatomy. So let me show you a quick demo of the first version of this, of this open access viewing and research platform and what anyone, including you, can do with it. So what you see here is a model of the respiratory system according to Aristotle in the 4th century BC. You can turn it around, see it as you would be looking at the body from any direction. You can see the name of the part in Greek and its translation. You can fade a part to look deeper into the next layers. Or you can hide the part entirely and to really delve deeper and explore. If you click on a part, you'll see a short summary which explains to you the, the meaning of the term, its history. And you can click to go further and get further details and an extensive historical lexical discussion of the term. And you can also see a list of references, which are so important for our researchers and for our users. You can search for a term in English or in ancient Greek. We'll suggest what we think you might be looking for. And once you click on a term and search for it, you'll see results results in the 3D models which include this part, uh, lexical terms which include it. You can filter, you can sort according to the author, the period, the anatomical system. And of course, from this page, you can go further back to the, a model or back into the lexical historical discussion. 
The range of viewing and study tools that I just showed you are the result of another important part in the work of my team, in the, work of my team the product thinking. This is a concept which is fairly alien to academic research, certainly in the humanities, but a crucial one. Having product experts on our team who understand our research through the daily collaborative work and who can also apply methods from the worlds of product and entrepreneurship, this is what allows us to understand the needs of researchers, the needs of other users, and it's what allows us to design and tailor the interface according to these needs. It is what is allowing us to plan ahead, to create a sustainable platform and ensure that this platform can continue to grow in content and to adapt to the needs of scholars from diverse fields. Because this atlas, these models, are just the beginning. It's a massive, but still an initial step to advance research, to advance the way we are doing research. And I bring this way of thinking and researching into my teaching as well. You can he see here some of the results of this. I know this slide is overwhelming, but the ideas of students are overwhelming. These are only some of the ideas uh, for digital resources designed by, by my students, for undergraduate and graduate students. And such projects are possible because I teach the students in the humanities faculty about the importance of collaboration with other fields inside and outside academia, in, of, of the importance of creating new resources and new tools for humanistic studies. And I'm also working with other colleagues from different fields to combine the forces of ancient and modern science through virt virtual reality simulators, for example, or by improving machine learning and artificial intelligence. It is this reality that I've begun to create, and it is this reality that I seek to continue to create with my students, with my team, and with my colleagues here at the Hebrew University. And I invite you to take the first step into this reality by visiting our atlas and exploring ancient medicine in the digital age. Thank you.